called a chest pass, right? And I used to get them in the face. <laughs> I just wanted to know that she respected the game of netball. What even is netball? Harrison, you are a freak! This is the sport evolving at its very best. Unbelievable. <laughs> Can you believe it? No mai ki te hōtaka o te neti poro kiwi. Welcome to the Kiwi Netball Show. I'm Bridget Tunnicliffe and today we're talking rules. Yes, umpiring. So joining me is ANZ Premiership and International Umpire Gareth Fowler and veteran player Te Huinga Reo Selby Rickett. So Gareth, the last time we spoke, we talked about the possibility that as a result of COVID-19 and some new exemptions, you might umpire a test involving the Silver Ferns. As it turned out, you did umpire the t- Tiny Jamison series last year between the Ferns and and England Roses. Then in March, you also umpired the Constellation Cup. How was that? Hey, well, it was a real honour and a pri- privilege to have the opportunity to umpire the Silver Ferns and, you know, full-blown test matches. And uh, to be fair, it was pretty nerve-wracking. We didn't really know what we were getting ourselves into, but um, we were really fortunate that with Garrett Williamson's um, contacts with rugby that we actually had a, um, a team's meeting with, uh, Paul Williams, who was uh, he refereed the first Gladysloe Cup game last year, and um, he gave us some pretty good, um, well, preparatory information to help us with what it might feel like. You know, he had to endure the anthem and also the haka. Obviously, we don't have that in netball, but um, it did. He spoke about how he felt when he um, was was viewing that. It helped us prepare well mentally. You know, we saw in the in the in the Con Cup, especially, you know, some really tightly contested games. It was thrilling to to be a part of. That absolutely was the case. Every umpiring call was it was something riding on it in such a tight and closely contested set of matches over you know four games over six days is pretty full on. We had the opportunity to to review and reflect each game so that we were, you know, continuing to add value to those games and making sure the players can uh, express themselves on court well. The level of concentration required to to umpire a game of that intensity, you must be exhausted at the end of the game. Oh, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And, um, you know, we put not only a lot of time into our physical fitness, um, but also um, our mental fitness. And, um, you know, we spend a lot of time with our vision. So, you know, a lot of us have accessed uh, support in that regard. So, you know, for example, um, every year I'll go and see a sports vision specialist and and test things like my reaction time, like um, overloading my eyes, my so that just like any other muscle, you know, you're putting it under stress so that Mm -hmm. you you can perform really well and um, be prepared for everything that comes at you. Well, the efforts that you're, you're going to are impressive. Um, the last time we talked on the show, that did include a discussion around the change to the short pass rule, um, that old chestnut, and there did seem to be a little bit of confusion from the Diamonds about the interpretation of that rule. I thought it was pretty clear cut. It's in its second year now. Who, as a defender, are you getting used to it? Yeah, I've definitely got used to it. I um, Yeah, I was a bit confused at the, at the beginning. I didn't understand because you still have to be three feet away from someone as a defender so it's really, it's almost impossible to get the ball between two people if they're really using that new rule to their full advantage. You kind of just have to do your best to move around the back pair and try to get your hands in and out, in and out as quick as you um, possibly can. But I've, I haven't really found a huge problem with it. Um, like I thought I would have actually, yeah, quite liked it. You can still get the ball um, if your hands are quick enough and if you move your feet enough. So, yeah, I've, I've actually, yeah, had no problem with it. Okay, Gareth, let's we could talk about game management and sanctions. So it goes first caution, then warning, then next step is suspension, two minutes off, and then the final uh, step is ordering off for the rest of the game. Is that right? Yeah, that's um, dead right. Like, um, so we often might see someone go through that entire process from caution to warning to suspension to ordering off. But however, there are kind of some variances. So, for example, for for reckless play, and so reckless play is when someone, um, you know, a player takes an action that has a disregard for the safety of another player, um, or dangerous play, 
um, the warning as the starting point. And, um, and it could also be in more serious cases that someone could be uh, suspended or ordered off at the first instance of foul play. Mm. And over the first three rounds of the ANZ, we have seen some quite high penalty count games. I think Magic Pulse round two, about 70 penalties apiece. Uh, last weekend, Magic Stars up there again with the penalties. On Monday, Mystics versus Tactics, third quarter. Things are starting to get ratty. Let's have a listen to this little clip from Sky Sport about what happened next. Mm. So this is interesting. Corey. Let's listen in. I must wait for Corey to come over. We're getting a number of phases where there's borderline intentional okay. persistent. Okay. We don't want that. I'm giving you the chance to clean it up. Talk to your team. Can you tell your team? I think that's the first time I've seen that. Time called out during a game. Both captains called over. But I think what it did is it diffused the situation. It was good. Gareth, do you think we might see more of this from time to time when both sides are engaging in cynical play? You know, I think that was a really good piece of umpiring by Christy and Corey in that game. You know, there were a couple of things that had happened that, you know, you would rather not see in the game. And nipping it in the bud early was a really proactive approach. And, um, you know, the rules of netball do give us as umpires latitude to to do exactly as Christy and Corey did, you know, bring the captains over and talk through that. And um, I, I think that the important part is, is the responsiveness by, you know, all the parties involved, you know, the, the athletes and, and us as well, being proactive and, um, you know, nipping this kind of stuff in the bud. It is, it is a tool in our tool, toolbox. Obviously, with any tool, you don't want to overuse it. And I think that was a really, really good choice there in that game. Mm. Who do you think that's what players need sometimes? Both sides given a chance to clean up and a quick calling of timeout gives people a chance to just take a breath and chill out? Uh, yeah, definitely. I, um, Christy said something interesting. She said it's borderline intentional, which it does really get annoying uh, when you're on the team and, you, and, and people are doing that. Sometimes they can hide it well by making it look like they're going for a ball, but really they're obviously going to jump off side and it is to slow down play, which yeah. gets really annoying. So yeah, I thought that was great that she kind of pulled everyone to calm everyone down, not just one person will pick certain people out. And obviously sometimes certain people need to be picked out, but when it's happening all across the board like that, I thought that was, yeah, really good. And it does, as you said, give people just the time to calm down, breathe, and kind of focus back on just playing netball um, yep. <laughs> normally. Yes, yeah, so I thought that was well done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Also, the week before that, Angela Armstrong Lush called over Sam Winders and Whitney Sooners over to talk to them mm. about grabbing, said if it continued, there'd be a warning. Um, so an, an, another good example there. It made me think, though, I've never seen a player from each team, one player from each team, suspended or sent off at the same time. I mean, if that were to happen, it would kind of negate the punishment. Both teams would be equally affected. They haven't seen that scenario play out before. Gareth, under some rule, some of those rule changes that came into force early last year, the other area was around clarifying procedures for game management. So that included being able to call or involve your co-umpire a bit more. So in that clip, we heard Christy call over Corey, so he knew where things stood as well. I mean, that can only be a good thing for the overall control of the game too. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, the umpires being on the same page is so critical. And, and you know, we've seen some really closely contested games this year's ANZ Premiership. Um, in terms of game management, um, again, very important. We walk off after every quarter. If we've given a caution or a warning or whatever the case may be, we'll talk about that. We'll also talk about any potential um, trends or things like that that we might have noticed that we, we may need to... Um, deal with later we also um and who will know you know if there is a, a pattern starting to evolve with a certain behavior we will say something at the time to the person involved whether that's you know a simple thing like backline breaking at the center pass or it's um you know obstructions that are happening repeatedly you know we want to um try and get those to stop before having to intervene too much with the whistle but there obviously needs to be a point where we do so you know th those that Co-umpire communication is so critical because we are, you know, one united front out there. If an umpire had seen Maya Wilson's face push of Paris Mason, uh, Wilson made sure no one was looking, but if they had seen it, where would that come under? You'd skip the caution, right? Does that foul you know, play? That, that... 
So with that particular incident, you know, um, that's one that, as, as we know, was well off the ball. And and, and we in the game has to make, have to make the best call we can with the information that we've got. And sometimes we don't have all of that information. And um, that is a case where if there is a serious act of foul play in, a, in your co-umpire's half, the, um, the non-controlling umpire can hold time and um, they can you know, have a bit of a conference or a bit of a hooey with their um, co-umpire, talk about what they've seen and, and make a recommendation about a potential action that could happen. And in those serious instances, yes, they, that could end up with um, a suspension or an ordering off. So you would class that as falling under suspension or ordering off material? It definitely falls in that dangerous play mm-hmm. category. You know, it's one where, you know, your, your, your options are, you know, cut down to warning, suspension, ordering off. You know, uh, I wouldn't want to kind of completely prejudge anything, you know, not being on the game and seeing it for for myself and, and, and those types of things. I think it's it's one that you have all, you know, we all take a lot of learnings from everything that happens in the game. And, um, you know, we will obviously an, analyse those things so we can put in place learnings and um, try and, uh, pr- you know, I guess, pick those things up better next time and, mm. um, you know, as quickly as possible. Yeah. Right, I want to talk about substitutions now because the rules have changed a bit over the years and the ANZ Premiership rules are different to INF rules. So on the ANZ, you don't have to fake an injury. The player gets the attention of the umpire, uh, asks for a time out, and they sub out with the player who stood up on the sideline. Who is it a relief you don't have to fake those injuries anymore? Oh, yes, it was so silly. You'd, you'd try to think of something and then you'd hobble off even though nothing was wrong sometimes. And it actually was so stupid. And I think the umpire actually knew most of the time that there was nothing wrong with you. Like, But, it, yeah, there's no reason why we should have fake. If you, you know, if you want to get off and have a, um, you know, someone else come on, you, you should be able to just say, sub, I'm off. Um, so it's great that they've changed it. So, yeah, we're not trying to play actresses um, <laughs> anymore because we weren't very good at it most of the time. Yeah. yeah. Um, and in the Australian Domestic League, they have rolling subs. Gareth, following the Constellation Cup, Diamonds coach JC Marinkovic, during an interview with Australian media, talked about the Silver Ferns making rotations through the injury rule and that the interpretation was taken to another level. Those were her words. Um, like it almost caught them off guard. But Gareth, that's been the rule at international level for some time, hasn't it, making substitutions through the injury rule? Uh, you know, uh, yeah, the, the current rule is for um, internationally that if... Um, you ask the umpire for time, the umpire will ask you, what's it for? And a player, like we've pointed out, will say, you know, I've got an injury to my ankle or my finger or whatever the case may be. And, um, you know, that what what our kind of view is as an umpiring group is that we aren't doctors or physios. Like, we can't make a call on that. Whilst we might have an inkling that perhaps that's not a genuine injury, the reality is that we're not you know, we're not able to make that call. So if someone does come up to us, yes, we will you know, we'll hold time and then a substitution will occur. Mm. Um, it was quite evident that uh, there was occasions where I think they were taken a little bit by surprise by by that approach. Mm. But, you know, at the end of the day, but those are the kind of learnings that we that we have through each game. Yeah, I thought it, I was a bit surprised by that because those Diamonds players, apart from the debutants, those Diamonds players would have operated under that rule in previous tests anyway. So, yeah, I thought they would have been familiar with it. <laughs> I would like to now talk about one of the more misunderstood rules in the game, replay ball, who I've tried to explain replay ball to my nieces and I found it really difficult to explain. It's one of those instinctive things and you can't, you just know if you've replayed it, right? Oh, yes. Well, <laughs> yes. It's, I think, that Gareth, you can correct me, it's when having control and then losing control, not just tapping it or, you know, that kind of thing. But I think players have started to get quite... The word is a bit nifty now, and they tap the ball and then regain it again, which I think is having control of it because you've tapped it to gain advantage. But it's really yeah. tough because you haven't actually, this is really badly explained, but you haven't actually caught it and dropped it or had a lot of control. But you've seen some players, they will almost tap the ball on, almost like a, a bit of bounce to gain thing. But it's really hard to call that because they haven't had full control. But yeah, but for the... I guess Saturday or or whatever netballer, club netballer, yeah, it's having control of the ball, losing it and then regaining it again. <laughs> Gareth, what what is the difference between tipping the ball and batting the ball? Well, how do you define a bat? 
So, so a bat is a controlled hit of the ball, basically. Mm. So that means that if someone passes you the ball, you can hit it down and then catch it. And so that's what who's talking about, that you can actually hit it ahead and then move forward and catch it later. Um, the, the problem is when you get more than two things. So, for example, you couldn't bat the ball twice and then catch the ball. You could bat the ball twice, but the second bat to another player, that's okay. The, the clear replay is when someone catches the ball and they've got it in their hands, then they drop it yeah. and then they pick it up. That's yeah. the simple that's, replay. I, I, I get that, that one. It's the other one <laughs> I don't get so It's well. the other ones that are a bit more <laughs> um, a bit more complicated. So you can't so bat the ball in a controlled fashion, then tip it in an uncontrolled fashion and then catch it. You can, and this is one of the probably most misunderstood rules, rules and um, you often hear this in, in commentary on games at, at, at times where players are contesting for the ball in the air but none of the tips that they have are controlled mm. so it's all uncontrolled everyone's jumping up and competing for the ball yeah and then one person catches yeah. it but then often the, the, the people say well isn't that replay well that's not replay because none of those tips are, are controlled mm. so um so we would deem you know those types of tips in the air as controlled unless it's kind of hit deliberately to an area for you to go and chase that, at which point it becomes a bat. Right. So you, in theory, right. could tip the ball multiple, like dozens of times, <laughs> and as long as it's uncontrolled, it's okay. Yes, correct. You can um, tip the ball any number of times before regaining position. Right. Okay. Regaining position. So, cool. Yeah. So, okay. The uh, Applying the advantage rule, I always thought that once you call advantage on something you've seen, you can't then change your mind. You can't bring it back and play the penalty. But, Gareth, I think I've seen, are there a few exceptions where you can do that? Is there a small window of opportunity where you can change your mind? Yeah, there is. You know, we want to do what's right for the game because, you know, the, the decision-making around advantage for an umpire has got to be as close as possible to the time of the infringement. And um, so what that requires is the umpire to assess the impact of that infringement on the player who's been infringed and their ability to get the ball away to a viable option. So that's a pretty split-second judgment. And, um, mm. you know, and sometimes you can slightly duff it and, and sometimes you know, the, the contact or the obstruction might kind of impede that pass of the ball more than you originally anticipate, you know, and, and in that case, it's good umpiring to kind of say, hey, look, whether, you're in, whether or not you're in the middle of saying advantage contact or advantage obstruction, just to blow the whistle and say it's contact or whatever the case may be. Right. Um, because then it right. doesn't disadvantage the non-offending team. But it is something that um, it, as a group we work really, really hard on we are constantly challenging ourselves about what's best for the game in those circumstances. Mm. Okay, I'm going to go a bit old school now and talk about the toss-up. Uh, last year we mm -hmm. saw Josh Bowring use it in a game where two players caught the ball at the same time. I hadn't seen that in years. I replayed it in slow motion on my sky and they literally did catch it at the same time. So kudos to him for using it, given it so really used and kind of fallen out of favour. Um, I grabbed the thoughts of a couple of players in the few days after that game and they struggled to remember the last time they were involved in a toss-up. Gosh, I honestly couldn't even tell you. That was um, would have been a while ago. But because I'm... Yeah, no, I don't know. We, I haven't practised it since I was a kid, so... I couldn't tell you, I honestly don't know, probably back in year five. <laughs> to be fair, I'd completely forgotten about the rule. I didn't really know that it still um, applied to our game. Bring it back, 100%. There's so many times that I feel anyway as a player that the calls are 50-50, you know, they could go either way. And so why not bring it back? If the umpire's not sure or it, it does seem very marginal, then chuck in a toss-up. I would love it. I'd practice it, 100%. <laughs> I'd love to have a go at it. <laughs> Sam Winders at the end there. Who, would you mind having the, do you mind having the odd toss-up? Do, do you practice it? No, we, no, as I'm saying as um, Paul Govan. God, I don't even remember the last time. Maybe, yeah, when I was, oh, goodness, still at school we might have practiced. Um, but no, we, we haven't practiced. I've done a few. I don't remember the last one, but... um. Yeah, I think if yeah the umpires aren't sure and they actually do think both got at the same time, then I feel like they, they do go for them. But I think, I don't know, Gareth, you probably know, you guys generally know, well, have an idea of who had the ball first 
and things like that because I have seen them they're not I don't know if it's not a rule to have them at all but um I think people didn't necessarily like them as much well whoever did because it slowed the game down I mean we had to stop mm. yeah I didn't mind them I hated doing them though because I don't know all the intention and you and someone else standing there you know someone who's quicker to get their hands on yeah yeah I didn't really yeah. enjoy them but um yeah if there's an opportunity and they think it's what's best then yeah, bring them on. Yeah. Gareth, I guess the school of thought now is that as much as possible, the umpire has to make a call. And I guess it was an easy thing to fall back on. Um, and they wanted to move away from that. But it's still in the rules. Do you like knowing it's there if you need it? Well, yeah, it's actually littered across the rule book. You know, it, it's in, in many, many, many different rules. And um, it is something that is really used. And um, to be honest, like just like who and, and Polly as well, I, I can't remember the last time I did a toss up. So, um, and it's not something I've practiced for my umpiring either. So maybe I need to dust that off. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, um, it's largely there to deal with um, infringements that happen simultaneously. And um, I think what we know about netball is that you know that's a very very rare occurrence. I, I remember many, many years ago, we used to have lots of simultaneous breaking and toss-ups for that, but uh, it's very rare that two people will land in the centre third at exactly the same time. However, if there is a case like Josh had last year where someone does catch the ball simultaneously, then you know it, it's there for our use. You guys might be too young for this, but do you remember back in the day when the umpire would have to say play before you could do a throw in from out of court? Yep. <laughs> Who, <Play did>, <laughs> <laughs> Who were you playing back then? Do you remember that? No, I don't, I don't get what you mean. They, they oh, tell you to go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yes, yes yeah. It, it just sounds so babyish now. So, the ball they'd been out of court right and the player would stand there ready with their foot up to the line and they'd have to wait for the player to say or the umpire to oh, say play yeah. <laughs> before you could throw oh, it yeah. Yeah, back, yeah back then you used to have to um toe the line as well who um oh, and get it oh, yeah, but... perfectly right yeah <laughs> yeah terrible yeah. Yeah. Um, Gareth, again, going back to when I was playing at school, which is quite a long time ago, one of the things the umpire used to call you for was sandwiching. They would penalise you and literally say you can't sandwich a play. You know, so that's like two defenders um, either side of a shooter. Uh, when I looked up the INF rules yesterday, I did control F and I typed in sandwich and I couldn't see there's no sandwich in the INF rules. What's the deal there? Uh, <laughs> so there, there is a rule that does kind of correlate to that, which is the inevitable contact rule. So, um, so players, whether moving or stationary, may not position so closely to an opponent that this player is unable to move without contacting. So um, that is your absolute classic sandwich scenario. Right. Um, that again right. is quite rare in a game. Um, it can happen though, more often than a simultaneous infringement. <laughs> mm. um, and um, so that's because of the reason why um, that inevitable contact with two players defending a, an opposing player um, is so rare is because the third player there, so the non-infringing player or the non um, the attacking player, I should say, will more often than not have an opportunity to take an exit out one of the sides. Um, however, if they really are squishing them together, um, or squishing um, that attacker between two defenders like that, then that would be falling in this rule, the inevitable contact rule. Right, okay. Gareth, I've got a curly one for you. Uh, um, lean, leaning on the ball in the offside area, that that's okay as long as your mm -hmm. body doesn't touch that, that area. Okay, what, what if your hair touches? What if you have a long ponytail and that touches the offside area? Is that offside? Uh, <laughs> Is that considered part yes. of the body? Yes, that's offside, sadly. Really? <laughs> yep. Oh, I think I saw that. Yeah. Um, I might, might have been the Australian League and the ponytail touched the offside area and she wasn't called. Or okay. well, might not have been seen. We <laughs> yeah. 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 No, yeah, so definitely any part of the body, you know, whether that's um, the hair or whatever the case may be, that that is offside. Yep. Right, okay. Who... Just wanted to ask you, and I can't really remember if you are someone who does it, but why, when a goal is scored, do the goalkeeper and goal shoot fight for the ball so they can be the one to send it back to the centre? The ball's not in play. Don't you want to save your energy? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> um, yes. So what, what your team wants you is to control the ball. So control the ball if it's your centre pass next to get it back quickly so you have advantage. 
you know, going forward. Um, but if it's their send and pass to kind of give it back slowly ish, mm. um, just so your team has time to set up. But that's why they, that, yeah, they call it controlling, you know, the ball or controlling the center pass. Um, and so that's why, because then both wanting, and you get, when you're a goal keep or a goal shoot, your team is on your case constantly about doing that, you know, oh, get okay. up and control the ball. Right. So sometimes, right. But what I try to do is just get this understanding with the shooter, because I don't want to sit there fighting over the board. <laughs> It looks so silly, you know, and you're kind of like, as you said, what are they doing? And so for me, it's kind of getting understanding that if I get it, I'm not going to purposely throw it away. Some pick it up and just drop it behind them, mm. if you get what I mean. So the other person has to go and grab it and it slows down like that. So for me, it's just getting it, getting understanding you're both going to get it and just give it back, not fast, not slow, but just almost naturally. Um, but those moments are huge when there's not um, very long to go in the quarters or at the end, you know, there could be, 10 seconds left and if it's not your pass or if it you know you could overthrow it so we can waste that time there's little things like that that can happen in a game yeah um, so yeah. that control is actually really good but I hate the hustle yeah especially I mean I get it when it's coming down to the last minute of the quarter but yeah. like even in the middle I'm like gee who yeah. cares just the someone throw it back it. <laughs> yeah the centers love it when you have it and you give it straight to them so they can get in that circle and go um, and they hate it when the other team has it and they give it back to them slow and they have right. to go and find the ball. Just little moments like that that you want control of that center pass.